So, let's look at this without uh, any dialogue or anything. Just really fast. Uh, some gameplay spots and things that I really wanted to check out. So, uh, the thing that I really wanted to check out is is up ahead when we first see the gameplay, right? So, obviously is Nibelheim, right? We're obviously in Nibelheim. Um, we are clearly in the flashback. Where, uh, the, and what is the flashback, you say? Like, what the hell are we talking about? When Cloud goes to Calm, which happens at the end of the Yuffie DLC with the, with the crew, uh, everyone sort of grills Cloud about what the hell happened, right? What took place between you and Sephiroth? What is what is exactly going on? And Cloud recounts his story to the party about what takes place. But instead of it just being a story, you play it, right? It, it is actually a sequence that is playable where you and Sephiroth are, are essentially on an adventure back to Nibelheim where Cloud grew up to take care of some monsters at a reactor, right? This is Cloud's story of what is going on. So playable Sephiroth. Sephiroth was uh, technically, right, in your party and playable in the original, sorta, but not really. You couldn't like choose actions from him. He was just like God tier character. So you'd be this little dude with a sword and he essentially would smack things for a few thousand damage. He would use the biggest level magic and shit, wipe the floor with these giant monsters. And it would be like, there is a clear power difference here. <laughs> this guy is very good. Like, you were at level one, he was, like, at level, yeah, 50 or some shit like that. So it was a cool moment, right, to see, like, damn, is this how good we're eventually gonna get? Are these the spells we're eventually gonna get? Uh, because it's sort of a teaser at that. Anyway, in, in that part of the game, you revisit, uh, Nibelheim as well as, uh, Mount Nibel, or Mount Nibel, and you go up to the reactor. And I think we're already seeing, uh, a couple of those right here, and the question is, is, like, how much are we seeing? So here's my prediction. What is Sephiroth's endgame? And then we see this. So there's two very big comparisons that we can see from uh, what is going on. Number one, I think a lot of this is Unreal Engine 5, just uh, photogrammetry stuff. <laughs> I think that's what's going on, that this is, this is not even a high quality trailer. But I think a lot of what we're seeing out here is uh, UE5 uh, photogrammetry. And I think that's kind of what they're trying to tell us about these big scapes and big environments. You might be controlling Sephiroth in this scene. Yeah. I, and in fact, I think there's a very good chance that there's just some camera trickery because Cloud does all these unique animations, right? Look at him mount and all, all this, this funky shit. Look at all these like unique anims that he's got over here. And Sephiroth is just walking. So yeah, there's a very good chance that we're actually controlling Sephiroth in this sequence. Um, potentially even at the beginning, and there's just some camera trickery happening. Pretty high likelihood. I think, I think what, what gives it away is Cloud with all of his unique anims, right? He's got all this stuff, and Sephiroth doesn't do any of that. He sort of just walks over shit like a normal character would. You know? That makes sense. That's cool! That, that is essentially fulfilling the, uh, that is essentially fulfilling the, um, the requests that fans have had for years, right? You have to remember, you go back to the 90s, if anybody was around then, what was something that everyone wanted to do? Everyone wanted to, to revive Aerith, and everyone wanted to control Sephiroth. Whether or not those two things are going to happen is still up in the air, but I think one thing that they easily could do is the crazy, uh, is the crazy Game Shark hack that made Sephiroth playable. Make Sephiroth controllable, right? How about you control Sephiroth when you're walking around? You know, that'd be really cool. It doesn't, does it mean anything? No! This is essentially a memory, right? All this is, is a memory of Cloud, and he's depicting what is happening. Uh, on their, when, when he met Sephiroth and they went to the, the Nibelheim together. So does this have any critical importance? No, right? It is, he will never be a memory? Well, you are now, motherfucker. And a lot of people, I've been making some funny observations, right? I will say, some people have been making some funny ass observations of <laughs> man why does cloud have the buster sword if this is in the past that doesn't make any sense why is his armor set 
not the same armor set that one he has with Zach. I'm like, you are so close. <laughs> I'm sitting here. I'm like, you are this close, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> those are some amazing observations and you're right here. <laughs> it's just, you're not there yet. So great observations. All I'll say is uh, go play the original game. <laughs> some fantastic observations. Nobody tell them, right? Nobody tell them. Um, so here's some early uh, predictions as far as what we're looking at here. Here's the first one. So what are we looking at? Uh, an entrance to uh, Mount Nebel or potentially Nibelheim. Likely is Mount Nebel, right? Where they essentially start their journey. And uh, there's like a bridge, right? There's a lot of trees and there's a lot of foliage. You notice that, and I mean, it's pretty clear. There's bushes and pixelated shit everywhere because the bitrate sucks and we need a better quality version of this trailer. But there's actually trees. Do you see as you get further in, the trees are all dying, right? Granted, there's a lot of death here. All, all the plant life is dead, um, which is very telling because that's what Mako energy does. It sort of like fucks with shit. But the further the characters get in, you start to see all the trees are dead back there. So, and the next shot we see uh, that most of that stuff is gone. There's some random foliage here, but as you get further in, it's just like cratered rock and shit. So, uh, at this point, they're getting closer and closer to the reactor itself, and they can see how far they have to go, right? How this thing is way up in the distance somewhere up here. I think I see a pathway over here. I see potentially, like, pathways down here. Uh, I think we're just getting a look at much bigger zones that were, uh, that were available in the first game. Right? Yeah, granted, 935 meters away. This is the same sort of thing that's in the first game. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a little concerned, right? You can see the mansion? Where? Can you see the mansion? I don't know, because the mansion's actually in Nibelheim itself. They could have moved where the mansion is, you know? This isn't the dragon part, it's not raining. So, think back that it doesn't have to be exactly the same that potentially when they start going up here, it will change time of day and stuff like that. Like that could be a thing that takes place. Why isn't Tifa or her dad or whatever, like why aren't they with them? Well, the things will take place differently, right? Like they potentially could have gone ahead. They could be behind them. They could be any, they could be leading the party because there's a bunch of dangerous shit. You know, there's a lot of wonderfully easy excuses of why things aren't lining up one-to-one -one with what's going on. Why aren't the soldiers with them? It's like that, but that's all not important, right? And that's, because this is just showing shit off at this point and is essentially a moment where Cloud and, and, and Sephiroth are just recounting what the fuck happened or Cloud is recounting what happened. Um, yeah, the mansion is not even Nibelheim. So what are we looking at here? Uh, just to, just to put some comparison, shot number one, uh, which is the characters crossing a bridge and going into essentially a dense forest where they, you know, seemingly get further up and are at the base, uh, the foot of the mountain, right? The foot of all this crazy shit. Uh, I think we're looking at a scene right after this. I think, in fact, what we're looking at, and we can literally see the streetlights and shit. Here's the streetlights, um, the industrial-ass streetlights. I think this is this path right here. Right? This is right after everyone, like, takes the picture. This is after that stuff takes place. This this road looks very similar to this. So this is, this is on the way as they are making their way up the mountain. I was thinking that maybe this is, like, uh... Maybe this is back here? Right? Like, maybe it's back here as they're entering the town for the first time? And it could be, right? It could be that there's just a dense forest around this shit. In fact, we get to see a lot more, uh, in this shot of what's up here. Yeah, it's that it's definitely. Look at this shit, right? 100%. All these like all these lights and stuff like that. 100% this is exactly where this is. It's the top right. And they're on their way to the mountain. And then uh for anybody that is familiar, what happens at, after this once you go through this part of uh the map, you get to Mount Nebel. And it is this, uh, this shot, which technically represents a very long journey, right? Because this starts here, it goes all the way up, in, and you're very small while doing this, so this takes like a little while to get through. You go here, around here, over there, over there. You go up here to get some bonus shit, come down here, go around there, blah, 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 and then the famous bridge scene where everyone collapses, right? 
Um, that's not a forest, right? It is not. It is not. You have to understand that they have to flesh some shit out. So this isn't a forest. Um, what we're assuming is that what happens from here to here is this. Because it's not just going to be like, you're there. Like the old game. It's not. Uh, you're going to go through all this stuff and probably, once again, get some world building. The forest is dying. Like, all the plants and stuff, the closer you get to the reactor, is essentially diluting and, and falling apart. And then by the time you get to here, this moment is uh, pretty much right here, right? This is pretty much right here. That's sort of what they're going for. This is the first idea that this map represents this, you know? That at this point, we're, we're seeing the scale of what they're going for, something that is a lot a lot bigger, and the, the, the trek from the town to here is actually something substantial, right? That's that's what you should do. That you should expand on those things to build on to build on stuff, to run into some weird monsters. That's a great moment of world building that goes from that scene to this scene because yeah, you can see the progress of what Mako reactors out in towns in the wild actually do to shit. And this is literally the beginning of the game, right? This is like the first shit that you're going to be doing. So this is a wonderful opportunity to sort of teach the player how to do all this stuff. Cool. This is the bridge that collapses, yeah. That'll just happen later on. I'd imagine soon after this, Tifa and her dad or the, the rando, uh, rando soldier guy are gonna, they're gonna show up and they're gonna be here and, you know, you're gonna get to the bridge and it's gonna collapse and... Yeah, long story short, things are just gonna start playing out in a very similar fashion. Um, there is a little bit of concern, you know? Because, right, the first thing they showed of gameplay-wise is effectively... And I have to be- I have to be fair here. What is the first thing they showed gameplay-wise? It is essentially a walking simulator, um, of what maybe could be a not-so-open environment that is just a big road. Uh, still very corridor-like in many ways. And that- Here's the thing, at first I was like, uh-oh. Uh-oh. That might not be good. Right? This 150%, yeah, it, it's going to be a corridor that sort of gets you from column A to column B. Uh-oh, that might not be great. Um, and then I realized, of course it's going to be a corridor. Right? Of course it, I, I don't even think it's a wide linear thing. No, of course this is going to be a corridor. It should not be free roaming. Why should it not be free roaming? It's the first thing you do in the game. This is the tutorial. It's the same thing as going through the reactor. This is a flashback. The part where the game opens up in the original FF7 isn't this shit. It's after this story is over. It's once you open the doors of, of Calm, and then you see what world you have and where you go. Like, that's the part where the world actually opens up. So at one point, I was kind of disappointed where I was like, man, is this the, the whole game's going to be like this? That doesn't make any fucking sense. But maybe by the time you get back here, by the time you return to this place several hours into the game, which happens in the original, it'll open up a lot more. Maybe by the time you revisit this area, there will actually be different places to go and revisit. And hell, things are going to be different. If anybody remembers, uh, Calm is a lot different in Cloud's memory than it is when you actually visit the place. So this is all going to look different in some way, or is going to be accessible in different ways than the original. Yeah, you can literally see piping going through the mountains and stuff to, to funnel Mako out of here. Did I say calm? Yes, I, I meant Nibelheim. Yeah, like that's, th that's where I think this is not super worrying. That it's like, oh no, we're just gonna get a whole fucking insanely linear simulator. Um, no, no, no. One of the first things Nomura said that he really wanted to show people was like a big, expansive, vast environment, right? And that could be this. That that could be this. But at the same time, story-wise, is this moment for that? Is this usually, is this the spot of the game where that does happen? It's not. No. That happens after Calm. That happens after this story is complete. And then BAM! You honestly wouldn't mind a linear game? Well, I'm happy to say that Final Fantasy VII is pretty fucking linear. <laughs> Final Fantasy VII is an insanely linear game that gives a, enough freedom for you to feel like it's not insanely linear. E even the original FF7, right? It's like in the same way that a game like, and even the lead director of this game uh, quotes 
is one of his favorite games is Horizon, right? Horizon Zero Dawn is not technically an open world game. And he's actually, I think you think you're gonna get a lot of Horizon-ness stuff in here as far as like questing and uh, how, how world maps are, how si the scale of size of maps are. I think you're gonna get a lot of that shit in this game. And Hamaguchi, which is the lead director, has said that. The size of the maps of, of games like Horizon and how you progress in those worlds and stuff from like essentially a location to a location that is that is connected by like a town or something like that, I think that's what it is, is very similar to what the original FF7 is, right? That's really not that different. It's just the size of them is bigger, right? So I think that's kind of what we're getting a hint at here, but not seeing it exactly. Now we got these big zones with several locations that we can go to, but eventually if you got to get to the location you got to go through, your bitch ass has to get through the crystal caves, right? Your bitch ass has to get through uh, Junion Harbor. Think more like FF12, uh, sorta, yeah, but instead seamless, right? Either way, I think if if you did take some comparisons to um, a game like Horizon and how some of the stuff works in that game between questing and maybe some dungeons and stuff like that, you might find some comparisons to how big certain zones and, and locations are in, um, in this, right? You might get an idea of where they could be going. Maybe it doesn't need to be FF15 in size. That's not necessary. I think they have a lot of data, <laughs> you know? All, all I gotta say is that I think Square Enix has been testing the waters for this shit and the size of what FF7 could be for several, uh, for several titles. And they probably have a good idea of like what was good and what worked out before and what, what people would enjoy. Because I would like to think on their super flagship, you know, this is our precious baby Final Fantasy VII type shit, that they would make, they would make moving around the world really enjoyable. Because that's something that people have a very fond memory of, is the world map in FF7 Original. So that's my prediction as far as what we're looking at here. Um, let's go mute this for now, and also see if we can get something from what the characters are saying. But the future, even if it has been written, can past is for set in stone, the past is forever. But the future, even if it has been written, can be changed. So focus on the future, not the past. And we were just talking about this, how like Aerith is super aware, right? Now Aerith is psychotically aware of the, the situations that are happening with our characters, what happened before and what has to happen going forward, right? Now that fate is dead. Uh, once again, like further confirmation that like Aerith knows exactly what's going on. And if there's anybody that's not on board with this game technically being a sequel to the original Final Fantasy VII, I don't know what to tell you at this point. But we're getting there, right? This is practically like fourth wall breaking in some ways. He wants to finish what he started. He wants to reclaim his birthright. And rule over the planet with Jenova at his side. So, uh, Cloud is, uh, just, this is... This is him telling the story in calm, right? This is the this this dialogue likely is him just reciting the account that Sephiroth told him personally, uh, from what Cloud remembers in uh, Seven Remake, Remake Part One, right? In Remake Part One, you see like the sequence where Sephiroth is like, "It was my birthright," yada yada yada, right? I'm gonna re reclaim my birthright. That happens in this flashback. Cloud's memory of that shit taking place is literally from this sequence that we're that we're playing out here. So, so yes, he's just essentially stating uh, Sephiroth's intention because not everyone has that memory. <laughs> the rest of the party doesn't know what the fuck Sephiroth is on about. But Cloud has his own interpretation and his memories are what he's going over. I saw you lying there. So what is Sephiroth's endgame is a very interesting, right? That's definitely interesting because we have no idea, <laughs> you know? Because us as players, like we have, is it going to be similar? Is it just to get the black meteor and summon, I'm sorry, the, the black materia and summon meteor? Uh, the, the weird thing is that we don't, we don't technically know the answer to this because... Fuck, man, Sephiroth's got some weird intentions that come from a much different place than the original Sephiroth, right? So, uh, 
interesting setup here. I saw you lying there. I figured it was too late. Wait, what are you implying? That I died? That I'm some kind of imposter? So, uh, already setting into place, which actually starts the original Final Fantasy VII, um, starts, like, in VII Remake, there is already moments of doubt from Tifa that Cloud's recollection of time, of what happened, is screwed up, right? Where Cloud seemingly has a different account of what took place than she remembers. Tifa is essentially confronting Cloud about it, because Cloud is like... In the same way that he remembers Tifa practically getting killed by Sephiroth, right? She's like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm alive. Are you, what the hell are you in, what the hell are you saying? Um, and this is, this is already setting up kind of an interesting thing because this line of dialogue is not in the original. Uh, it's setting up something that I'm kind of excited about. That Cloud is already doubtful of his memories, but also is paranoid, right? Is also paranoid of the people around him because his recollection and account is so shoddy right just a reminder cloud ends this story in calm with the entire crazy event that happens and all the nutty shit and all the crazy frankenstein bullshit that happens to sephiroth and he eventually confronts uh he eventually confronts sephiroth in front of genova and they're about to square off and that is actually where Cloud's memory ends. And he says, I blacked out. I don't remember anything after that. And the rest of the party is like, how the hell do you not remember anything after that? He's like, well, I'm still alive, aren't I? So everyone else is like, the fuck are you talking about? Uh, so people are already concerned with Cloud's recollection of what takes place at that time frame. It's weird that the characters in the original game just sort of like never mention that again, <laughs> right? It is sort of weird that we really don't we really don't get any further exploration of that until much, 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 much later in the story where you actually start to get some characters like Tifa asking some stuff. But it seems like it might be happening a bit earlier, right? That might actually be obviously a big part of the game where is what Cloud is recalling true? <laughs> is this this bitch's story lining up? Yeah, and, that, and once again, it's another very interesting thing of how uh, it'll be it'll be great where you essentially get Cloud's memory of Nibelheim to when you actually visit Nibelheim and how different that's going to be in the new game because... Uh, because... In the old game, it's like people are playing their roles. Like, everyone is essentially working for Shinra, just living in the town. It, they're, they're all actors. Everything that happen, happens in Nibelheim is a crazy conspiracy. Um, is, is, is like a, is a, is a, is an undercover conspiracy and they're trying to hide what happened on that day and even Cloud doesn't know even Tifa doesn't have proper memories of what's going on in fact the events that take place in Nibelheim on that day are the big mystery of the original Final Fantasy 7 and l eventually leads to the big wow moment it'll be very fun right seeing how they depict a modern day Nibelheim um, that is essentially the undercover conspiracy Nibelheim, Area 51 shit that, sh that Shinra has set up to, to get rid of all the evidence. In fact, Tifa, Tifa, I think, has complete amnesia of a lot of what happens there, too, because of the cover-up. Wait, what are you implying? That I died? That I'm some kind of imposter? This is all mega spoilers, by the way. By, by the way. What is fact and what is fiction? Yes. I've seen a lot of people interpret this as the fact that the remake is going to be going in a completely different direction, right? I think I think people are referring to this as being like the remake aspect of it where as we continue through the game, it's just going to be completely different than the original, right? That what is what is different and what is real from what you remember? No. No, 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 no. This is that that's that is definitely a, an interpretation, but this is literally referring to the fact that our main character and the whole point of Final Fantasy VII Original is the fact that our main character is an unreliable narrator. Our, na our main character doesn't even know what is fact and fiction. And that is the literal foundation of the entire storytelling of the whole fucking game, right? 75, 80% of the game 
is built around the fact that we don't have all the information and the information we do have, we don't know is real or not. And in fact, other characters that are around Cloud are specifically lying to him to protect him uh, to a degree that is ridiculously unhealthy throughout the original game. So there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of this in part two for sure, because all of the answers of this story are not answered here, right? If anything, what is fact and fiction is not technically answered potentially until part three, if part three takes place after um, the Northern Crater. And that's like one of the big final reveals of Final Fantasy VII. You were here with me five years ago. Where are you? What happened to you? I'm trying so So this is interesting because this is this is Cloud literally talking about Zack. That's Zack talking? No, 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 no. It's it's Cloud talking about Zack. In Japanese it says Zaksu. In the Japanese version, it literally says Zaksu. Like he's talking about Zack. The last voice is Zack. This line right here. And if you if there was some confusion about this not being Cloud's voice actor, the, the Japanese one literally says like Zack, you were here with me five years ago, type shit. This is essentially Cloud recollecting the fact that, oh, this dude remembers Zack and is wondering now, like he's discovered a memory. What the fuck happened to this guy? Maybe he doesn't remember exactly what happened because that's literally about, that's Cloud's whole trauma, right? But somehow in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth Part Two, Cloud is discovering the thing that is the giant reveal of the near end of Final Fantasy VII Original. So that's super different. Final reveal where you see that it is some weird different dude that you eventually as the player like put it together, you know? So there is like a huge part of the game where Zack just doesn't exist. And weirdly enough, it looks like he does in this version of the game. This is once again, something that is dramatically different than the original is definitely tying towards, tying a bit closer towards their, their maybe multiple timeline shit or why the hell Zack is, uh, Cloud is having memories of Zack early on. It's interesting. Where are you? What happened to you? I'm trying so hard to find you. So they're all talking about Zack here, right? It's Aerith technically talking about Zack, technically. It's Cloud talking about Zack, right? Uh, this, this line right here is specifically from the, uh, is specifically from the date that Cloud and Aerith are on, where she is talking about, I'm trying to find you, right? But why is, uh, and, and she says this to him multiple times on the date in, what's it called, uh, fucking Golden Saucer? Um, but what is Aerith really asking there, right? What is her intention by saying that shit? She's not trying to find, she's trying to find the real Cloud, right? I'm trying to find the real you, because you're Zack, <laughs> right? That's the whole point, is that she knows that this fucking dude is just like Zack. So she's trying to find out, who the fuck are you? Like, who is this guy? That's, that's the point of that question. So once again, this is once again referring to a Zack conversation of the fuck, like, what, where the fuck is Zack, right? We're trying to find out who this, what happened to this dude, right? Where, where is this going on? Because once again, Aerith doesn't have a thing for Cloud, uh, Aerith, Aerith has a thing for Zack, right? That's where her story comes from. I'm trying so hard to find you. Sorry. Feel like I failed you. And that's Zack saying, I feel like I failed you. This is weird because this isn't, th this isn't her, him talking to Aerith, right? Right, this line is from Zack. I think we can all confirm that now. This line is from Zack. I don't think this is Cloud saying this. This is a different voice. I feel like I failed you. What happened to you? That's a completely different voice, right? That is Zack. Um, sorry, I feel like I failed you. What is that inferring? These characters aren't talking to each other, right? These characters are not talking. These are just lines of dialogue. Sorry, I feel like I failed you. This lines up a lot because what was Zack's thing in Crisis Core? I'm going to make my way back to you, right? I'm going to I'm going to make it back. I'm going to make it out of this shit. I'm going to get back to the church. She's going to be waiting for me. That's the end of my story. And then he gets fucking murdered, right? That is his story. So he made this promise and he feels like he failed her. But why would Zach be saying this? How you lines directly up with this. 
Listen. Hey. Talking to Cloud? He saved Cloud's life! How did he fail Cloud? He saved his life! He's not talking to Cloud. I mean, seemingly in Zack's timeline, right where he lives, he saved Cloud's ass. He fought off all those dudes. Kicked their ass. He didn't fail it. He didn't fail Cloud at all. To me, there's one person that he fails and we literally see the setup for it. I'm back! To me, he's not talking to Aerith. This bitch is talking about Aerith. She's dead. And I think this is just further confirmation of that. Where by the time he got back to, uh, by the time he got back to the, the church and everything, and did essentially what he was meant to do, maybe a plate fell on her? I don't know, right? Something, everybody's crying and shit. Something, some disaster happened. She's either dead or gone. And Zack is not talking to her. He's talking like about her because that's, th that line of dialogue makes the most sense. So, that's my breakdown of what they're doing with this shit, right? My breakdown is that Zareth is either missing and or possibly and or uh, or possibly dead in Zack's timeline. This is how Rebirth will give us both dead Aerith and not dead Aerith. Maybe, you know, there, there's a lot of crazy shit that they could do. Here's once again my theory, right? The theory is that Aerith always has to die, right? In every timeline, she has to die in some way. That's my that's my personal take that we find out that she doesn't make it in other timelines, that in some way, Cloud and his crew will find out that she doesn't actually make it in other timelines, and they will do everything they can to make sure she survives, right? That will be the goal of the party. We're going to change. Even if it has been written, can be changed. So focus on the future, not the past. We are going to change the past. I'm sorry, we're going to change the future because we can't stop the past. Even though you didn't make it before, you're going to make it now.